Well, thank you everybody for being with us. I'm Father Chris Alar. It is great to be back finally after weeks away. I've been in the Philippines. I was giving a retreat to many priests, uh, 850 priests and 16 bishops. Um, I was traveling, then we had our ordination of Father Jason. So we didn't even know if you would come back to join us. So we are very glad that we're back. Today is a talk, a special talk on the last installment of the Woke series I was doing. This is the fourth talk on the Woke series. Uh, we've already done a talk on defining Woke, what it is. We did a talk on the Pride Movement and gay marriage. And then we did a talk on transgenderism and what that is all about, what the church teaches. Remember, this is all about what the church teaches. And today is everything else. So we will cover critical race theory, Black Lives Matter, DEI, which is diversity, inclusion, um, equity and inclusion, defunding the police, love or hatred of your country, patriotism, removal of God from society, climate change, electrical vehicles, and gender neutral bathrooms. So you're like, oh brother, Father Chris, how are you gonna get all this? Well, we're gonna give it a try. So let us start with a prayer, in name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send the Holy Spirit down to renew this land, renew the United States and all the countries in the world trying to strive to live in your mercy. And Mother Mary, we ask that you intercede for us and we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. The first one we're going to hit is the longest by far. It takes more time than all the others combined because it's so important. And that is critical race theory, which is sweeping our schools uh, and our kids and actually the great Catholic group, the Cardinal Newman Society, actually came out with a statement on the ways that Catholic education and critical race theory are incompatible. But yet we're told that we must have this in our schools. No, we don't. Let's hear. I'm not, I'm not asking you to condemn anything without just hearing what all the elements are. We hear one side from the schools. Let's hear now the other side in, in what this is all about. Now, yes, it's true, America, we continue to struggle with the consequences of slavery and in the injustices of racism. We know this. So let's look at our next slide. What is critical race theory? What is it? Okay. Catholic education teaches that God's will for humanity is helping us to rise above hatred and injustice. Nobody doubts that. But critical race theory, which I'll just call CRT, promotes a false political ideology that aims to divide rather than heal American society in the viewpoint of many theologians, and scholars, but many you can't hear because we don't hear their voices. I'm going to give you the voice of one, Dr. Denise Donahue. And so she summarized it very good, and I want to go through this. She gave some points, and she talked about Catholic education and then CRT, critical race theory. And here's what she said. First, Catholic education teaches the dignity of all people made in the image and likeness of God. You've heard this before. But critical race theory, she says, has its origins, not in that, but in critical theory. Critical race theory came from critical theory, which is a Marxist movement that views all things through the lens of power and divides society into oppressors and the oppressed, even though most of us don't fall into either category. I said before a couple of weeks ago, I'm certainly not oppressed. And I laughed and I said, other than cameraman Giuseppe, I'm really not an oppressor and I'm teasing because I love cameraman Giuseppe. But critical race theory marks this division 
according to racial lines. Now, the church and Martin Luther King Jr. said we are to have a colorblind society, not a society based on color. Number two, Dr. Donnie, you said the Catholic education system conforms our consciences to Christ and his church, but CRT imputes bias, unconscious bias, upon persons based on their color and deems racism a permanent condition that we can never get rid of. Next, she said, Catholic education teaches that sin is an individual fault that can have a social impact, but CRT, critical race theory, imputes guilt for social sins committed in the past by those not even alive onto us today based on our color. This is wrong. She goes on to say Catholic education teaches the unity of faith and reason and helps students to know and live the truth. However, critical race theory is skeptical of objective truth. It rejects the Western intellectual tradition. It places the individual experience and cultural constructivism over reason. Everybody, that's the why we are in the mess we are in today. We are crushing objective truth. She says, Catholic education recognizes individual autonomy and cultivates the student's capacity for reason without regard to skin color. But CRT assumes that race defines how you think, how you act, and how you look at the world. All I know is the way I think, the way I act, and the way I look at the world has absolutely nothing to do with your skin color. So I, they're not talking to me because I could care less. If you're black, red, purple, green, we are all children of God. And this is what the church is trying to teach. Next, she says, Catholic education observes human accomplishments and failings according to the church by which racism is one element of a fallen world. But critical race theory demands that history be taught through the lens of race, power, and privilege. Why? If we're ever going to, you know, if you have a scab on your arm, when I was a kid, boy, would my mom yell at me. Because if I was outside playing and I got a cut and I get a scab, I would always pick it off and then it would start bleeding all over again. You had to let it heal. If you keep picking at it, it's never going to heal. Are there mistakes of the past? Of course. But if we keep picking on it, we're never going to heal that scab. And so, two more. She said, Catholic education favors literature that promotes understanding of the human condition across all time and culture. However, critical race theory demands that classical texts be removed and contemporary literature is what we use, this narrowly focused, which is on race and social deconstruction. Crazy. And finally, the Catholic education, it respects the natural and religious rights of parents to direct the children, their children's teaching, working with the school. But CRT manipulates the education to form children according to this reshaped culture, indoctrination. You may be listening to this thinking, ah, you know, I don't, I don't really need to hear about all this. This is destroying Western civilization. Division and constant renewal 
of hatred and past sins. How are we going to move forward? Not saying to ignore the past. So there's a good article out on the National Catholic Register uh, by Matt D'Antono, and he says, I know what critical race theory is, and here's why I'm against it. Let me just quote from him. He said, while some Catholics may have been racist, it is clear that the institution of the church has vehemently condemned racism and slavery. Did you know this? I get letters all the time saying how the church promoted slavery. This is not true. I've got a list, and you can find it on two of my past homilies, of a dozen church documents, encyclicals, papal bulls condemning slavery and racism. Now, were there a few bad priests that mistreated the natives? Of course, but that was not church teaching as an institution, all right? So since its beginning, the church has condemned this. The basic idea of CRT is that racism is intrinsic to white people. This is what your children are being taught in school. These are little five-year-old kids. It's crazy. Just as communism posits an intrinsic struggle between the classes, the rich and the poor, critical race theory puts intrinsic struggles between the races. Some of these CRT theorists say they're communist and we're teaching it in our schools. Anytime there is an inequality between the races, there must be racism, they say. White people have to admit that they are racist, and if they do not, it is only because they are blind to their own racism. Well, I point to our next slide. Let's look at our next slide. I'm gonna to point to a great man, Martin Luther King Jr. He envisioned a race-neutral society not one giving privilege based on race, either white or black, but one that did not look at race for any reason. What a great idea. Why do we keep picking this scab? The claim that current inequalities are the result of white racism or any racism doesn't really hold up to the studies. They don't take into account other factors like social forces or culture. I had a good friend, she taught in the inner city of Detroit. And she said, do you know how the culture is, Father Chris? That I had a little girl in fifth grade. She was a straight A student, a minority, beautiful little girl. She was a straight A student, how smart, pretty, cute, friendly. By sixth to seventh grade, she was flunking all her classes. And so she finally got her to open up this little girl to tell her what happened. And the little girl said, I was made fun of so bad. I was picked on. I was made to be humiliated because I did good in school. That's a cultural issue, not a race issue. And so we ask for your prayers for these poor kids. You know, this um, writer named Fesser shows that CRT is opposed to Catholicism. And he draws parallels with this. He says that CRT takes the route of division and hatred, where Catholicism condemns any race being oppressive, white or black, but instead invites all men to have mutual respect, forgiveness, mercy, and love. So as Catholics, we must oppose critical race theory because we are opposed to racism. Because we are. All right, now let's go to just a couple more and then we're gonna get on to the next subjects, such as uh, BLM. Now, CRT, there's another article by Patrick Riley in the National Catholic Register, is the wrong way to teach about race for Catholics. He said, critical race theory seeks to divide the world into racial categories. 
Faithful Catholic education should not do that, but bring healing through an encounter with God. But this divisive approach, this political ideology, is opposed to really everything in Western civilization, which the church built, because it is associated with what they say everything is racist. Catholic education embraces the classical philosophy of the West and our insights about human society, freedom, conscience, law. Therefore, Catholic education and CRT are completely incompatible. Please know what your children are being taught. Dr. Donahue said critical race theory misapplies personal sin into groups. They blame you for the sin of 200 years ago because of your color. Irredeemably, it condemns those it labels as oppressors and condemns those who may happen to even look like oppressors. And it makes moral demands of those it believes to have privilege resulting from historic oppression. Really? It's funny because he always talk about white oppression and clericalism. I don't get any clericalism. I get condemned everywhere I go. I'm, be, I'm called a pedophile. I'm, I'm called a hater and a bigot. And I'm certainly not praised because I'm white. If anything, I'm condemned more in the letters because I am white. I'm not asking for privilege. Just asking to do what Martin Luther King said. And this is what the church teaches, not me. Be colorblind when it comes to people. This is what he said. Donahue goes on and says, it's attempts to empower itself by manipulating race-based feelings of guilt in those, in any way it connects to its claims. It provides these group of sinners a way to feel good about themselves once they acknowledge that they're guilty. But should you have that guilt? I don't think anybody here watching his own slaves, slaves is a horrible part of the past, but I don't think any of you watching or here in the shrine has ever owned slaves. So do we need to be punished for that? Why not harmony in saying, let's bury the past, live together for a brighter future? Rather than adopting these CRT Approaches, Catholics should rely on instruction provided by the church, the church documents, the U.S. bishop's letters, the catechism. These are where you find justice and dignity. We, the church, have 2,000 years of this. So Catholic education offers Christ and the gospel to the world as the solution, not picking at the scab. So let's go on to our next slide. This is one of the favorite, my favorite guys in the world, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. He's an African-American deacon out of Portland. This guy is one of my favorite people in the whole world. I'm going to be doing a pilgrimage with him to the most incredible apparition site in the history of the church, Einselden. And I'm going to put that information up at the end of this talk. Him and I are going there. I, I, there's no other place in the world right now I would rather go. The most incredible church apparition in the history of the church nobody's heard about. Einzelden. And I'm going with him there in April. Maybe you can join us. Well, he says, we must be careful of the term institutional racism. Now, this is an African-American speaking. He said, in order to factually claim that an institution is racist, you must show that the institution actively promotes racism through official or unofficial policies, procedures, or directives that enshrine the belief that one race is superior to another. He said, you've got to prove that. Institutional racism must be distinguished from individuals within institution who are racist. 
So what he's saying is the government, the church, they may have racist members. The church may have racist priests, but that doesn't make the institution of the church racist. What a very good statement. He says, we must continue. The church herself, founded by Jesus Christ, he says, is not racist, but there are undoubtedly individuals within the church, clergy and laity, who may be racist. Likewise, the police, in and of themselves, law enforcement agencies are not racist. But, there are unquestionably individuals within those agencies who exhibit prejudice, who are racist. So when we see a beating, everybody wants now to defund the police, but yet has anybody stopped to say, it appears that individual is racist. The other 99 out of 100 cops didn't do that. This one cop did. Maybe better to say that cop is racist rather than the 99 other police officers are racist. And so this is what we have. We must recognize the fact that we are all sinners in need of God's mercy and that we are still dealing with original sin. We need to see past stereotypes. We have to need to see past, beyond stereotypes and see individual people. And he says, I think we're starting to do that. How? He went on to say, a racist nation does not elect a president who is black. A racist nation would not allow that. A race systemically racist, does that mean there's not racist people in the nation? Of course there are. But a systemically racist nation would never allow Kamala Harris to be vice president if this was a systemic racist country, as our president keeps telling us we are. This is not what the church says. The church says we are broken and we are individually responsible. We have to get ourselves individually back on track. You wouldn't have, he said, a race in North Carolina where both the Democrat and the Republican candidates are black. We've made progress. There's a, a writer out there, his name is Hanson. He argues in response to the Utah chapter of BLM, Black Lives Matter, on 4th of July, called anybody who flies the American flag racist. I fly the American flag. We will fly the American flag at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. We will fly the American flag at the Association of Marian Helpers. And I don't know one person in this institution that works here that is racist. And we will fly the American flag. He went on to point out that hypocrisy of many because of their cries of racism despite being privileged themselves. He pointed out the NFL. These are millionaires for playing a game, screaming that they are underprivileged. I'm so happy I'm a priest. But if I was making millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to play a game, could I really say I was underprivileged? Just food for thought. Just food for thought. That's the epitome of the American dream. In America, you were allowed to, to receive tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to play a game. I don't care if you're black or white. You're not underprivileged. You were given the American dream. How beautiful. There's a statement on Catholic Answers that I would like to read. It says, critical race theory is a grave threat to the American way of life. 
It divides Americans by race and promotes race essentialism, racial stereotyping, and racially based segregation, all under a false pursuit of social justice. Critical race theory training programs have become commonplace at schools, government, and corporations where they've sought to advance the ideology through indoctrination, intimidation, and even harassment. Hmm, just think about that. Now I'd like to continue with what Deacon Harold said about BLM. Let's go to our next slide. This is Black Lives Matter. And I think this is an incredibly important topic. And there was an article in Catholic News Agency talking about how the organization is led. There's a man named Lewis Brown, also African-American, that said in his essay on the first things, quote, our brothers and sisters who peacefully protest for justice with signs of Black Lives Matter march justly. They are good. However, there is a difference between asserting that black lives matter, which is true and just, and the BLM organization itself, which has questions. Now, this is a black leader, and he said the BML, BLM Global Network Foundation, you probably didn't know this, there's a difference just between Black Lives Matter on a sign, which is good, and the BLM Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, where there's been proven a huge mismanagement of funds and teaching. He said that this is the wrong organization to lead an important movement against racism because it asserts an agenda that will cause harm to black families. Hashtag Black Lives Matter, you may know it began to go viral online after the death of Trayvon Martin in 2012. And the movement grew after the riots in Ferguson, Missouri, do you remember this, in 2014, after the young African-American Michael Brown was shot by a police officer. Again, we're not trying to justify any kind of violence unjustified. But he goes on that there are many organizations that take the name Black Lives Matter. I bet you didn't know this. It's not just Black Lives Matter. That's very true. Black Lives Matter, of course. But there's an organization called the BLM Global Network Foundation. Let's go to our next slide. This is it. The largest and best funded of all the groups is this Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, which has a network of local chapters around the US and in other countries. Do you know what their own manifesto teaches? Their own manifesto, support of abortion, redefining marriage, transgenderism, destroying the nuclear family, destroying the patriarchy of the father, and embracing Marxism. All of these are against Catholic Church teaching. You cannot be Catholic and follow that manifesto. We're not saying that black lives shouldn't matter. Of course they do. They're God's everybody, every life is God's. But that manifesto that we as a foundation support abortion, redefining marriage, destroying the patriarchy, transgenderism, and Marxism is against everything the Catholic Church teaches. You can't support that foundation and be Catholic. Lewis Brown said the organization asserts a worldview of moral relativism and recognizes no objective truth. It disrupts the family and undermines the natural law of God. 
Hmm. By advocating for gender ideology, BLM rejects the truths of human dignity and the natural law. Gender ideology replaces the science and biology reality of maleness and femaleness with the false belief that your sex can be changed. Can't. As recently as September 2020, on their webpage, it said, our group is a, quote, redefining marriage network that works to freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather the belief that all in the world are heterosexual, to dismantle heterosexual privilege and to disrupt the nuclear family. The, the family is the basis of God's creation. Why do we want to destroy that? Let's go to our next slide. This is an amazing cardinal, Cardinal Wilfred Napier of South Africa. This is his picture. He himself, as you can see, is black. And he tweeted, it's time to state honestly what black, or black Lives Matter really stands for, destroying the traditional family and what it actually does destroying property, including religious buildings and objects. You know, he was part of the struggle in South Africa against apartheid, so he knows racism. And he's saying this is dangerous. Back to Deacon Harold, one of my favorites, I said. I said he's the black deacon in, in Portland. He told Catholic World Report that he draws a distinction between a movement and an organization. When you put those three words together, he said, Black Lives Matter, it's a social movement. It's a statement of truth and it is a good thing. The term Black Lives Matter though, is different from the national organization the Black Lives Matter Foundation. He said the organization's values raise many red flags. He said the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation does not even address the importance of fatherhood, but rather wants to destroy it. Why? Look at all that, plus the violence that is being perpetrated, the rioting, the looting, the tearing down statues, all of these things, no Catholic in good conscience can have anything to do with a group like that, period. God bless you, Deacon Harold. He's not condemning Black Lives, black lives Matter. He is black. Of course it matters to him. But what the organization is doing, mismanaging funds, destroying the family, supporting abortion, redefining marriage, he's saying is wrong. This is important. There's a Pentecostal minister named Eugene Rivers, who's the director of the Seymour Institute for Black Church and Policy Studies. He called the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation a scam that exploits the suffering of black people to promote gender ideology. Fascinating comment. River said the group has, quote, repudiated Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy, replacing it with irrational ideas that have so quickly led to violence in its name rather than maintaining the nonviolent high ground of Martin Luther King Jr. and what he stood for in his Christian perspective. Wow. Wow. He said an authentic movement for racial justice needs to be rooted in love, 
in Christ. Not in this foundation's actions, he pointed out. Okay, let's go to our next slide. How about this one? Defund the police. Do we want to do this? Well, I just ask you to think about it because there have been mistakes in police departments. There's been mistakes in the church. But Deacon Harold distinguishes, as we said, between institutions which are maybe not racist, but may include racist individuals. He said, quote, unfortunately, people are blurring the lines. So when you see things like what happened to George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or someone who has died at the hands of law enforcement, you think the institution of law enforcement overall is racist, but this isn't true. The police officer was. Deacon Harold makes the same distinction with Catholicism. He said the church is an institution. It was founded by Christ. The church itself is not racist. However, the church does have racist members in it. That's how we have to view this. We don't condemn Christ's church because of a couple idiots. You don't leave Jesus because of Judas. He said, the thing is, the church is made up of human beings who are all sinful and in need of God's mercy. So, there may be racists in it, but the teaching of the institution is not racist. These are the words of Deacon Harold. Whether you be Hispanic, African-American like he is, the church is not teaching racism. Individual priests or laity may be racist, but you know what? I'm a priest, and I can tell you this honestly from my heart. You know what I've been told? And I've been in Rome, I've been at the Vatican, I've been in Australia, I've been in North America, I've been in Europe, I've been in Asia. You know what I've heard everywhere I go? The future of the church, the hope of the church, are the Spanish, the Hispanics, in Mexico, in South America, and Africa, the blacks. That is what I have heard every time I go somewhere. You think the church favors white Europeans? Uh Uh-uh. The church has recognized that has died. The future are the Hispanics, the Latinos, and the Africans. This is the future. Does that sound like a racist institution? No. But could there be racist individuals in that institution? Yes. But that doesn't make the institution racist, just like our nation. There may be racist individuals. I'm not denying that. I know I'm going to get a lot of letters from you about somebody that said something or flew a flag. I'm not doubting there aren't racist individuals, but that does not make this nation systemically racist. Again, as uh, Dr. Donahue said, we wouldn't have had a black president or a currently vice president. We just, we're just asking you to think about this. So Dr. Harold, or Deacon Harold, sees the Black Lives Matter organization differently. He says the organization is using Black Lives Matter as a cover for what they're really trying to promote. They're trying to redefine society, redefine sexuality, redefine marriage, restructure the family, destroy the patriarchy, all based on Marxist socialistic principles. Now, if you want to know if Marxism works, ask our brothers and sisters in Venezuela or other places where it is failing miserably. Marxism is not the answer. I think of our Hispanics and African-Americans and those in Africa 
that suffered tremendously. But the ones I have met have never said Marxism is the answer. This foundation is trying to tell you Marxism is the answer. Just be careful. I'm not condemning anybody based on the color of their skin. I'm trying to do the opposite. Saying, please don't call others racist based on the color of their skin. And he finished by saying, this is Deacon Harold, if black lives really matter to the national organization and foundation, he said, where is their plan for stability and development in black neighborhoods, in Hispanic neighborhoods? What is their plan to end drugs and gang violence in our neighborhoods? Where is their plan to strengthen the family instead of eliminate the family? 70% of black children are born out of wedlock. The vast majority of those black people who are incarcerated in prison have no fathers. And yet, they want to dismantle the family and get rid of fathers. This makes no sense. The kids need protection, yet they are trying to defund the police. What is their plan to create educational opportunities? What is their plan for minority entrepreneurship? Great question. I have that very same question. I'm so glad that it was spoken by a minority. Now let's go on. Sorry, I had to spend too much time on that, but I think it's important. I hope you understand. Let's go on to the elimination of God from our country and society. Let's take a look at our next slide. Anti-patriotism. Kneeling, for instance, the national anthem. No, I know, I know that many claims it's to end racism. But let's look at this bigger picture because it's not just kneeling. Our children are being taught to hate our country because of this agenda. This is wrong. There's an article in the National Catholic Register by Anna Abbott called Patriotism is an, a Virtue, is an Unsung Virtue. Now listen to what Pope Leo, my favorite pope, said. To love both countries that are of earth below and that of heaven below is the duty of Christians. You gotta love both countries, on the earth above, uh, below and in heaven above. Faustina, St. Faustina, she loved and prayed for her country despite its many faults and abortions. I meet many people from the Philippines here at our shrine that love their country. I meet many people from Mexico and Colombia and South America, Central America. We have some here today that love their country despite their faults, despite the drug cartels and the violence. These people have remained Catholic, have held on and persevered despite having families ravaged by the drug cartels or their own children be addicted to fentanyl or cocaine, or heroin. Yet they love their country because they know that it's given to them by God. Here in the U.S., it was patriotism that helped bring people together after the tough time after September the 11th, 2001. But that's gone now. Pope Leo XIII wrote, natural love of our own country have natural love of your country and supernatural love for your church. Have a natural love for your country and a supernatural love for your church. We can read in the catechism, the discussion of patriotism is in there. It's under the section, honor your father and mother. Isn't that interesting? And another part called participation in social life. Catechism 2239 says patriotism is living the virtue of charity. 
Jesus told this to Faustina. This charity takes the form of being a good citizen from ordinary actions like voting, cleaning up your city parks, serving in the military. You're a patriot. I see more people coming from other nations that are more patriotic than us born here because they love the freedom they were given to come and worship God. Try doing that in many other nations. Try doing this in North Korea or Vietnam or in places where you can't. Vietnam is getting better. I, I do have friends, priests and nuns in Vietnam, but North Korea, the Middle East, you could be beheaded for practicing your Catholic faith. Patriotism does not mean having a blind, unquestioning love of your country. It is faultless. No, it has faults. But debunking the anti-American narratives of Howard Zinn and the 1619 Project does not mean that we forget about the mistakes of the past. There were mistakes of the past. It doesn't mean that we say Christopher Columbus was a sinless saint. We don't say that. Christopher Columbus made mistakes. But many of the people that have salvation through the Catholic Church received it from those who came. And it doesn't mean that they were treated the right way. They were not. But something more important is the gift of the faith. Our founding fathers are not on par with the fathers of the church. But it also doesn't mean that we have a hatred of our history. Let's go to our next slide. In fact, our history is a lot of times misunderstood. Do you know who the first slaves in America were? The first slaves in America were not from Africa. They were white slaves from Ireland. Those are the first slaves in America a year before the first slaves arrived from Africa. The word slave, do you know where that comes from? Does anybody know where the word slave comes from? It actually comes from the word Slav. I'm Slav. I'm Croatian on my father's side. I'm Czechoslovakian on my mom's side. I'm Slav, Slavic. The word slave comes from Slav because they were the most enslaved people in the whole world in the Middle Ages. But we don't hear that. I know you're gonna send me letters saying, stop being racist. I I'm not. I'm just trying to say that there's a bigger picture for us to consider. It's not just one side, it's, it's both sides because of broken humanity. Should we have retribution? for slavery? Well, that's a good question. But then should we have retribution for those who died fighting in the Civil War to free the slaves? In Monroe, Michigan, where I'm from, they have a, a museum there of all those who died in the Civil War from my hometown. These were men who died, white men who died fighting to free the slaves. Should their relatives get retribution? just asking the question. The virtue of patriotism is opposed to the intent of both either destroying the past and sugarcoating it. Both are wrong. But we don't bury the truth. It is love of our country, not idolatry of the government. I love my country. Government makes me upset sometimes. <laughs> But Jesus did the same thing. Didn't Jesus weep for Jerusalem? It was a specific love for a specific place, a specific town. It wasn't, Jesus didn't promote globalism. Jesus didn't say we should have a one world government. He told St. Faustina to pray for her nation, Poland. Sadly, many millennials now think the American flag is nothing but hatred and intolerance. This is troubling because hatred of your own country is not a building block for the future. 
We are to love our family, and from that comes a love of your homeland, a love of your nation. As I meet people here, like I said, from Mexico and Colombia and, and, and Argentina, I, I haven't heard any of them say, I hate my homeland. They, they love their family. Back in 1995, John Paul told the United Nations that there are rights of nations, extensions of human rights that apply to a community, beginning with the right of a nation to exist. Why do we want to destroy nations and build a one world government? This is not biblical. In fact, actually there's warnings against it. St. Faustina, I said, talked about the sovereignty of nations in the diary. She prayed for Poland. Other countries are not teaching their children to hate their country. The West is going to die. If we keep allowing this, and somebody will say, Father, stop being political. No, Jesus was very political. It's what got him in trouble. He spoke up against the Pharisees. He spoke up against the Sadducees. He said, you're vipers. You're a brood and a den of vipers, serpents. That's what got him in trouble. He spoke up about what was wrong. And if any of you want to sit by and watch Western civilization be destroyed because you think it's political, you need to read the Catechism of the Catholic Church that tells us we need to be involved in politics when souls and the human person, the dignity of the human person are at stake. China and Russia, they're teaching science, not equity and diversity. A bridge doesn't work very well if it's built on diversity instead of math. I can promise you. In China, kids are learning quantum physics. Our kids are a drag queen story time. Are we doing anything to stand up for our country? The removal of God. This is the next big one. The removal of God. What are we doing? Pope Benedict said in the West, especially in the United States, it is increasingly, the, the government is increasingly pushing a secular agenda. Pushing it means driving the church, not just out of the public square, but out of the entire culture. In 2012, the Secretary of Health and Human Services of the United States government delivered a mandate informing all religious institutions, especially Catholic universities and hospitals, that they would have to provide contraceptives, abortion pills, and sterilization in their insurance plans. The Health and Human Services mandate is not isolated, this incident, but it's part of a larger bigger campaign by the secular minds of Europe and America to shrink the influence of Christianity in the world until it finally disappears from history. You can call me a conspiracy theorist, but all you have to do is look around you. It's not a conspiracy. They want to reverse the church. Eliminate it. Brutal de-Christianization has happened many times. The French Revolution, Soviet Union, Spain, revolution in Spain, revolution in Mexico. Vivo Cristo Rey. Viva Cristo Rey. Viva, <laughs> Viva La Mexico. This is the home of Blessed Miguel Pro. Viva. Viva with the love of his church. Blessed Miguel Pro is my hero because he stood up 
He got political and he died for it. I don't know, will there come a time where I will die for it? Maybe. I have a big mouth. But I always said, if God gave me a big mouth, I'm going to use it for him. We saw this in Nazi Germany when they took over Europe. It continues today. Now it's happening in the United States. Let's go to our next slide. Take down the Ten Commandments. No reading the Bible in schools. No public prayer. Remove the nativity scene. You can't say Merry Christmas. You must go to parades redefining marriage. All this goes against church teaching. The message of all of these secular agendas is clear. You must worship the state. You must kneel down before the state. This is why Marxism is doing what it's doing. It's what it's all about. God must be removed so that the state has full authority. It is usually packaged in something that looks good. But when secularists preach tolerance, they practice what the Pope called negative tolerance, complete with standards of thinking that are supposed to be imposed on everyone. It's what we in America call political correctness. The result, the Pope said, is actually a destruction of tolerance. For it means that religion and the Christian faith are no longer allowed to express itself visibly. That result is the real aim, the removal of Christianity from our culture. Cultural relativism, do what you want. We're not gonna have the church to tell you what's right or wrong. Let us affirm all views as equally good. All ways of living are equally adm admirable. All thoughts are equally true. False, that is wrong and incorrect. With no God to define good or evil, people become their own little gods. Creating your own moral rules. Guess what? You're breaking the first commandment. They falsely believe this is true freedom and tolerance. It's enslavement to the devil. All right, let's finish up with the others. DEI, let's go to our next slide. This is diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, they are not absolute values. They will not be present in heaven. Did you know this? For example, there will be no diversity of religious belief in heaven. There will not be 40,000 different religions in heaven. There will be one. The one started by Jesus Christ. That is our faith. How about equity? Will there be equity in heaven? Absolutely not. The church has always taught that when we die, not all will be rewarded or punished equally. The more good you do, you will be rewarded more. The more evil you do, the more you will not. This does not work. In heaven, there is no DEI. And you know what? Doesn't work much on earth either. This ideology hires people based on race and sex, not on your own achievements. One member said, being a black woman, homosexual, is not an accomplishment. It's your choices. It's not an accomplishment. You can say anything about a white male heterosexual. I'm white, I'm male, and I'm heterosexual. 
That's not an accomplishment. I don't need to be rewarded for that. A white heterosexual male does not need to be rewarded, but neither does a black female homosexual. This is not what the church teaches. But DEI and all our companies today prioritizes identity-based differences over merit. Where you put your genitals does not define your personhood. It's your choices. Focusing on diversity excludes qualified individuals who don't belong to underrepresented groups. Catholic teachings have emphasized the inherent dignity of all human beings, black, Hispanic, or Caucasian. There's nothing wrong with diversity, inclusion, and equity. There's nothing wrong with it. It's good. But this should not be our sole basis. A Catholic school should ask if this is all we want to offer our students, schools, are now existing just for DEI. Schools should exist to teach the truth. The truth is God. So we should teach God. We should, should, so should not deeper, more fundamental concerns drive our schools? Concerns that are eternal and moral rather than practical or based on skin color. Emphasizing individual identities undermines unity in Christ by highlighting differences rather than commonness. We must stand united, not celebrating disunity. You never heard this. Disunity we keep putting under diversity. It's good. No, it's not. If you have a set standard truth, is everybody diverging from it, diversity, a good thing? If Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, is diverging from that, diversity, a good thing? No. Unity is a good thing. We are all children of God and Jesus Christ is our savior. We have to have standards. If, if your school or company sets a standard, is it good that you diverge from that? If the diversity means, well, I don't have to wear proper clothing. I don't have to talk properly. I can use vulgar language. I can diverge. I can be diverse. I don't want to follow a standard, a moral guideline. I want to diverge from that. No. People crave a great deal more than just difference. We crave truth. What's above us, the existential. They crave something bigger than themselves, something that can supply meaning and purpose. Almost done. Difference, for difference's sake, leads to nowhere. To be different, just to be different, leads nowhere. What good are diverse authors if they don't teach you the truth? Does their skin color matter if they're not teaching you the truth? If their views are not in line with the truth and forming unity? Does the color of their skin matter? Diversity officers in the military are making almost $200,000 a year. But our enlisted men and women, our privates and corp uh, corporals and stuff, they can barely pay the bills. My nephew was an enlisted man, a private, in the army, could barely pay his bills, but yet diversity officers are making about $200,000 a year in the military. Really? Senator Gates says this causes a real problem. It limits our readiness as an as a army. 
He said, China is focused on artificial intelligence, which will allow them to rule the world, while we are focused on pronouns. This is serious. Traditional Americans are leaving the military like crazy. What are we going to do? Critical race theory causes U.S. soldiers not to tr trust the man next to them. They're forcing critical race theory in the military, and it's causing the military soldiers. I read stories of two of them that got out of the military because they don't trust the man next to them. Is this what we want to teach? When my dad was in the military, you were taught to trust your life to the guy next to you. It didn't matter if he was black or white, Hispanic, Latino, Mexican, African, Norwegian, Canadian. It didn't matter. Let's go to our next slide. This is Father Dwight Longnecker, one of the good priests out there. And he said, the call for diversity is really an agenda for division. Wow. And the call for inclusion is ultimately an agenda for exclusion. Really? By pushing through the acceptance of non-Catholic beliefs. Listen to this. This is probably the most powerful line of this whole talk. Listen to this. By pushing through the acceptance of non-Catholic beliefs and morality... Non-Catholic beliefs and morality, the Catholic Church will be torn apart. And in seeking to include everyone, even those who have no desire to live as Catholics, those who wish to follow the historic Catholic faith will be excluded. It's going to cause division. This, in the name of inclusion, where we have to bring in non-Catholic views will cause division and exclusion of those who want to follow traditional Catholic views. Okay, so we only got a couple minutes left. I'm going to show you a quick video. It's only two minutes. And this quick video is what is DEI? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Great video, only two minutes. Let's take a look. Every big company. They feel like they have to. They have to say something. They have to signal to the world that they're doing something. Is it effective? No. Uh, in fact, it seems to be doing worse. It seems to be making people uh, less likely to interact with people who are unlike them, you know, because it's like a minefield now. Less likely to interact. After a training where you hear things about microaggressions, if you ask somebody what they do for a living, somehow that's racist, right? If you learn that, then why would you take a chance? I better not talk to Eric because I might say something wrong. Precisely. So now inclusion means I'm going to silence myself and not talk to the black people. This Harvard professor analyzed studies of them. Sadly enough, I did not find one single study which have, has found that diversity training, in fact, leads to more diversity. In fact, the Harvard Business Review reports five years after diversity training, the share of black women managers actually decreased. It's not about data. It's about a power grab. A power grab that starts in schools. Melt the steel bars of racism and white language supremacy. This expert tells teachers it's racist to teach traditional English. If you use a single standard to grade your students' languaging, you engage in racism. This education reformer, Chris Rufo, proposes an alternative. EMC, Equality, Merit, and Colorblindness. Yeah. I like equality and merit and colorblindness. Merit is a good thing. But demanding it, we're told, hurts minorities. Our students of color struggle and fail even when we are, are there to help them. So some colleges drop admissions tests. High schools eliminate honors classes. What is that going to do to an entire group of people? Nothing good. I mean, if you wanted to hold down a group of people without them knowing it, this woke thing is a good strategy. The gap between black and white students is widening. Minority and underserved students falling further behind. What's the better way? Talking. People don't say what they feel because they don't want to get canceled. They don't want to be called racist. People are censoring. And we have to stop doing that. Okay, so that is a very powerful video by a member 
of the secular media. Um, very surprising, and I think it was on regular network TV. So very good to listen. Now, how does the church then become more inclusive and diverse? If, Father, you're telling us that it's DEI's not the way to go. Well, when different sinful people are converted to the faith in Jesus, in other words, evangelizing them, then the church becomes more inclusive and diverse. We do this by fulfilling the great command, the great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. You know, Bishop Barron says, these are valuable, diversity, equity, and inclusion, only when they facilitate the realization of fundamental and absolute values, such as justice, truth, and love. But love is willing the good of the other, not worrying about their feelings. It's the truth. Right now, DEI is not doing this. A social order can exist only when its members recognize a common good, not a false truth. Pope Leo XIII, greatest pope ever, there naturally exists, he said, among mankind differences of the most important kind. People differ in capacity. People differ in skill, in health and strength. Unequal fortune is a necessary result of unequal conditions. The church welcomes everyone, but only on Christ's terms, not your own terms. Fascinating. All right, so we finish with climate change and electric vehicles. All right, this is fascinating. Let's go to our next slide. What is climate change? All right, this is a very important topic. And it's commonly said that 97% of scientists agree that global warming is man-made. I've always heard that. But did you know that the Wall Street Journal found the 97% number is predicated only on a handful of surveys and abstract counting exercises that have been contradicted by more reliable research. That number, we don't know if it's true. Organizations such as the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, called the IPCC, have modified and deleted peer reviews from scientists that challenge the IPCC reports. Whoa. Hmm. There are theories that put climate change as a means to advocate reducing global population. Now you can see a motive. Proponents argue that shrinking population would provide less pressure on resources. Okay. But this raises ethical questions. God told us to be fruitful and multiply. Many agree addressing overconsumption and resource distribution, which is all messed up, are going to be more effective in promoting sustainability than just focusing on reducing the population. This is demonic. Why does Satan want to reduce the population? Because then he proves God a liar. God said that our, our progeny, our descendants would spread as far as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. If Satan can reduce the population, he proves God a liar. This is why he's behind it. You know, this also undermines the authority of the United States. A key nation is Saudi Arabia, and they wanted to partner with the United States. They're based on oil. And the United States told them, nope, we're going green. Now Saudi Arabia is one of the major players in the de-dollarization, which is going to crush our economy, destroy our way of life. It's going to happen if we don't pray and stand up. China is building oil refineries all over the place. Huh. 
For every clean coal plant we close in the United States, China opens two dirty coal plants. Is this good for the world environment? But in the meantime, it's destroying our jobs and the resources we have. The global elite, the hatred for the West and the church exists because those are the only two remaining obstacles to the new world order. Fascinating. In the West, we have freedom. Not control of the people, but people are more controlled when the population is controlled. This is the motive. Control the population, you control the people more easily. Freedom is led by America. So it must destroy America through this woke division and hatred of the United States. Destroy America, freedom falls. And when freedom falls, the people are controlled. This is what's happening. In the church, they want to destroy that too because we have God. The church must be brought down so that the state, the government, can become God. That was the problem with Stalin and Hitler, Nazism, communism. They, wanted to, they were atheistic and wanted to destroy the church so that they would be God. Hitler wanted to be God. Stalin wanted to be God. Mao Zedong wanted to be God. That's why they had to destroy the church. To achieve this global objective of depopulization and control of the masses, you have to defeat the Catholic Church, the last standing institution that holds life sacred by standing against abortion, birth control, gay marriage, etc. Well, what about the electric vehicles? Let's go to our next slide. Electric vehicles, you may have some. I think they can be good in, in certain ways. But President Biden wants 60% of all cars to be electric soon, but we don't have enough power in our electrical grid. This is gonna be a disaster. If every country accomplished their targets for electric vehicles by 2030, we're talking only six and a half years away. Guess what the impact will do to the environment. If every country in the world achieves their goals of electric cars by 2030, take a guess at the impact to the environment. It will be a point zero 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 two degree change. If all of the countries meet their electrical vehicles quotas, there will be a 0 0.0002 degree change. Wow. But in the meantime, I come from the Detroit auto industry. I built American cars. I have a vested interest in this. All those jobs are disappearing. I just talked to my old friend at American Axle, said all oh, this company is gonna be going away. All those jobs will be lost. As a priest, I am to care about your livelihood. I am to care that you can put food on your table. Getting away from US dominance on energy just so China can have it will put us all out of work. We'll become a complete Banana Republic, as they call it. But nobody's talking about this. Going to electric vehicles has some benefits, but what about the problems? It's pollution. We, we want to improve pollution, but do you realize the problems that are now created? First of all, having power sources available for electric cars. We don't have them. Costs. For low-income families, electric vehicles are very expensive. How are we gonna get low-income people to get to work if they don't have mass transit? Scarcity of raw materials for manufacturing. This is why China's buying up Africa. 
Pollution concerns, there's many. Battery limitations, you can't go on long distance trips because the battery needs to be recharged. And if you're in the desert, where are you gonna recharge? Dependence on lithium ion batteries, it's a whole problem. The overall environmental impact of producing electric cars. These are all major issues. The battery range limitations prohibits long distance travel because you don't have stations in the rural parts. An overload on the electrical grids. If many people start charging their vehicles at the same time, the grids will collapse. The lack of en entry level models that people can afford. Mining activities associated with sourcing the materials are gonna be destructive of the environment. We mentioned lithium ion batteries. This is a critical component of electric vehicles. They require extraction of lithium and cobalt and this mining is destroying the habitat. Water pollution, adverse effects on local people, destroying their villages. How come we don't hear about this? because there's an agenda. Huge supply chain disruptions from geopolitical dependencies on countries that have the raw materials. Because of pollution, it will be essential to consider the entire life cycle and emissions of producing these batteries. People think there's no emissions. There's tons of greenhouse gases for the production Battery production and disposal process contribute more to pollution. The manufacturing phase requires energy intensive processes that emit greenhouse gases. Nobody is talking about this. Proper recycling methods are gonna be needed to ensure that batteries are properly disposed of because those are toxic. I mean, have we thought through this? We have our president just mandating the destruction of fossil fuels without factoring in any of these equations. And so I'm running out of time, and I'm only gonna mention a few words on the last one. Let's go to our last slide. Gender neutral bathrooms and men in women's sports. Hot button issue today. Think about this. Privacy concerns risk, increased risk of harassment, physical safety. There's been assaults in women's locker rooms by men who are allowed to come in. Safety concerns, impact that survivors of trauma have if they see a man undressing in front of them. Lack of accountability, men can just come and go as they please. What about the moral considerations? Maybe a woman does not want to see a naked man. These must be taken into account by disregarding the need for separate spaces. General uh, gender neutral bathrooms fail to provide safe environments, especially for those who've experienced trauma. Societies, we have cultural norms values, beliefs, you're entitled to privacy. You should be able to change. If you're a woman, you shouldn't be forced to change in front of a man. Modesty, personal boundaries, these are now gone. Men and women's sports has led to serious injuries and unfair competition. God bless Riley Gaines and others who are speaking out. Several others have spoken out. Men and women are equal but different. This is how God made us. Equal but different. Ultimately, this agenda is about removing God and gaining control of the people. That's what it's about. And that is satanic. And so in the process, we are destroying Western civilization and 2,000 years of church history. I understand, 
I'll get letters. Father, stop being political. I keep going back to the catechism. When souls are at stake, priests are supposed to be political. And right now there are souls at stake, especially our youth that are being raised to be taught not the truth, but a lie. We will be morally responsible before God. What did we do to teach the truth? And if you say, Father, well, I really don't know what the truth is, that is the purpose of this whole talk. I gave you church teaching and church writings on these matters. We don't have to be afraid of the truth. We might get canceled. We might get persecuted. But in the end, the truth will persevere. God bless all of you for joining us and standing for the truth. Our country is worth fighting for. And our children are especially worth fighting for. And you can say if, yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely. And, and that is not political. That is solely based on the creation of man in the image and likeness of God. He created us, man and female, male and, male and female, to serve him, love him, and follow him. And to be his disciples, he gave us the guidelines of the church. Let us not turn away from those beautiful guides to get us to heaven. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Very good. And I do want to finish with you. If you could join me, uh, I'm going to have Brother Mark put up the last slide. If you want to become part of our Marian family, we would love to have you. It doesn't cost anything. It takes about 20 seconds to do it. You do not have to donate any money. I'm not interested. I mean, obviously we need funds, I always say, to keep the place running. And if somebody's able to help us, we're very grateful. But I'm more concerned about your soul. And if you go to micprayers.org, seen on your screen, you can join our Marian family. Only takes a couple minutes, doesn't cost anything, but you'll start sharing in the graces of our rosaries, prayers, penances, and masses, just like you were Marian priest or brother. Amazing. And finally, my two books, if you want to get those, you can get them on shopmercy.org. I have my book, Understanding Divine Mercy. Everything you need to know about the teachings of divine mercy the next is Suicide and Hope that you can also get on Shop Mercy or at the website listed there, suicideandhope.com. It's not just about suicide, but any kind of suffering or loss. And then finally, I talked a lot this, this talk about Deacon Harold. There it is. Join us on April the 9th through April the 20th, 2024, as we will be doing a pilgrimage to Austria, Bavaria, Germany, Einzelden, Switzerland, where we will be going around to see the most incredible apparition in church history, Einzelden. And I did a talk on it about two years ago. You can find it online. Incredible. And we'll be there with Deacon Harold. If you want to join us, please call my assistant Peter. He's in the office. The phone number is there on your screen. So God bless all of you. Thank you for joining us. And we'll be back next week with our continuing going back to seminary. So God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. I, I thought we were going to go and visit my dad's grave today. I know. It's the anniversary of his passing, and I can't remember the last time we went there. I know, I, I know you loved him very much, but he's not here anymore. I don't think he'd be upset if you don't go visit his grave this one time. For a soul in purgatory, family or loved ones are of no importance if they cannot be expected to help them.
way to help and the ultimate proof of love or friendship which the soul desires and awaits more than anything is prayer. <laughs> 